you got a box of chocolates over there, you'll pull Forrest Gump. Like um, speaking of Forrest Gump, there's a scene where the Malone and Hood movement to walk through the schoolhouse doors is emblemized in the film Forrest Gump, where they, you know how that film works, right? Where there are historical moments, there's historical footage that then is spliced in with Forrest Gump doing stuff and interacting. And Vivian Malone drops her notebook, I think it's a notebook or a pencil, and he goes, oh, man, you dropped this. And just made it. Yeah, that, that was filmed, well, not filmed over there, but that was the uh, Foster Auditorium moment. So not Hall here, this is the Honors College now, but it was also the first medical college in the state. So this was before we lost all the grants and money that comes along with the medical school to UAB. But this was where folks would come. This was sort of the flagship institution's medical school. And it's named for Josiah Knott who was a eugenicist. Y'all know what eugenics is? Someone tell me what eugenics is. It translates like this. You means good, eugenics means genes. Good genes. Yeah. Right. So it's about sort of maintaining racial lines, first of all. It's about maintaining racial purity in one, on one hand, okay? So ensuring that people don't mix, ensuring that uh, groups of folks get particular privileges based on the hierarchy of their genes themselves. And it became a super science of sorts, right? So in medical school, there would be, for instance, a eugenics lab that was put up, and it was kind of a part of the curriculum. Like if you were a med student, you might take phlebotomy and I don't know what they take, that's all I know. Uh, <laughs> you know, internal medicine and whatever else, you might have your specialty, but you were taking maybe a eugenics, a, a eugenics class. So the ways in which we, we create hierarchies and try to maintain those under the guise of medicine, right? Under the guise of science and the scientific method. We had a lab in the basement. We had a eugenics lab. The basement, uh, anyone honor students who frequent this place over here? So if you go downstairs to the computer lab, familiar with this? On the left side, there was a morgue. Yeah, ghosts. There was a morgue, and on the other side, there was a eugenics lab where black men in particular were taken from the west side of Tuscaloosa, and intelligence tests were performed on them to essentially measure the ways in which they weren't as smart as white folk. And they create things like political policy, right? Legislative policy, social codes would be covered because it's science. It's exact. It's a scientific method. It's not politics. Rice Hospital over that way engaged in sterilization programs where they would look at, they were taking people who were considered infirm, right? Asylum dwellers, oh, what they also yes. called them, and they would sterilize them so they wouldn't reproduce. Which is like the extreme part of eugenics, the idea of sterilization. That's the ultimate control of genetics. Okay? Is ex that's, a, that's a bad metaphor. That's a bad performing metaphor. Excising out, right? Those genes that don't fit. That's taking place over here. We've got racial eugenics taking place over here. And this is all happening at the time of the Tuskegee experiments. Y'all know what that is? Oh, what those God. are? Okay, what are the Tuskegee experiments? Oh, um, remember? It was it was under it was poor black men in Tuskegee and they were offered health care. Um, and the doctor said that they were treating them for uh, Local, what things uh, they were treating them? Uh, no, they weren't treating them for syphilis, but uh, they were treating them just for anything that might be wrong with them. But they weren't telling them that they were giving them all of these uh, men syphilis, and uh, they were just tracking uh, the results. And at any point, they could have given them um, a vaccination to stop it, but they didn't. Um, a lot kind of these guys died. I mean, a simple, a simple shot. And the majority of, of the experiments, too, is they'd have a control group of folks who didn't have syphilis and they would test effects. Then they'd have a, uh, what's, wait, if it's not a control group, what's the other one? Uncontrolled. Sample? <laughs> Experimental group? Yeah. I don't, Carol Mills, if you take in her classes, she would kill me for not knowing this stuff, by the way. Um, the other group of men would have syphilis and they would be denied treatment, like a penicillin shot, a simple yeah. shot. And this went on, by the way. How, when do you think this went on? It starts in 1930. How long do you think it goes? 72. 72 is the last of the syphilis experiments. A penicillin shot 
within the first two years of the study was determined to be the easiest, quickest fix. So what would that have been? 32? So what is that, 40 years that men underwent this experiment, this longitudinal study? This launches something called the um, IRB, which is a review board for whenever you're doing human subjects experimentation or work, you have to get it covered, you have to get it approved by the university, which sort of launches that idea of an IRB board as far as exp uh, experimentation and studies go, research goes. But most importantly is it pointed out in a very stark way the ways in which black folk in the South, in this country as a whole, in the South and in the state of Alabama in particular, were sort of understood and, uh, and used in a lot of ways to shore up things like eugenics, to shore up things like racial hierarchies that would be rooted in science that would support the social part of it. So I think it's important to think about not all in the context of Bryce, but really in the context of Tuskegee. And the shitter of all this, too, is that Tuskegee Institute is founded by Booker T. Washington, right? one of the first major free black institutions of education rolling out of the Civil War, rolling out of Reconstruction. Okay? And that's the site at which the experiments took place, or in the town of Tuskegee, which is sort of a slap, right? Like a huge slap. So think about that. Um, not a lot to, of positivity that comes out of this as well, I suppose, but if we link it up to the other sites, I think that we sort of get a sense of moving ahead, constantly moving ahead, but not forgetting these places, right? There's a debate on our campus right now about whether to rename buildings like Knott Hall, Morgan Hall, or Ferguson. Do y'all know who Ferguson was on our campus? He was the last holdout of the Board of Trustees that attempted to prevent desegregation from taking place. He was like the last vote, he was the last holdout was the last rebel standing and that's where you all are looking at your headquarters interesting right and so there's a debate do we change those names do we keep those names i have a perspective on this that i'm not going to poison your well with but i'll say this much that if we have buildings named as their names it keeps the conversation going if we have buildings whose names we change it's popular for about a year in the press and then you may forget so i'm not going to tell you where what side i reside on but you probably get a good sense and it connects with this tour overall, that the spaces that, the places and spaces where we're at that are a part of who we are, and we remember, but we don't dwell, right? We don't dwell, we dwell in the present and future, but we remember the past in order to do that better. So if you're taking any lesson out of here before we hit spring break, I think it's that. And also knowing where you are always. Wherever you go in life, not, this is not a Dr. Seuss, oh, the places you'll go lesson. But wherever you are, there you are for sure. And because that's where you are, look around because it's you. It's a your identity. So know, know where you are and know who you are in that place. Right? So I hope this has helped you get a little sense of that. The next stop, the last stop, will be a slave memorial. It's about this talk over by the biology building for Jack and Boise, the two man servants that were brought over with President Manley. Um, you can go check that out on your own. We're about out of time. But in the packet, there's a story about that as well as an apology for slavery from the faculty. Senate that accompanied in 2004 the construction of that slave memorial. If you go, don't get excited because the small cemetery behind the memorial is not Jack, that's not where Jack and Boise are. That was a white family actually who lived on the university and served the campus. So you get the mistake, maybe it's a slave, a slave grave, but it's not. Uh, but the memorial is certainly there. So that's our quick, quick tour. If y'all ever want to go on a deeper tour, or if you want to talk about the mound or the Civil War on campus, or ghosts and things like that, let me know. I mean, I'm happy to walk around with you anytime. If you want to hear it, I'll take it. I mean, you just give me your ear, and I'll, I'll lend a voice. Otherwise, thank you guys for coming on. Yeah.